This algebraic geometry video will continue the discussion of blowing up from the previous video. So the first example we want to do is what happens if we blow up a point of the real plane R2? What do we get as a topological space? So we draw R2 and we're going to blow up this point here. So what this means is that R2 has coordinates x, comma, y, and we're going to introduce new coordinates s, comma, t for the projective line. And we're going to take the set of all points x, y, s, colon, t, such that x, t equals y, s. So this will be a subset of R2 times P1. And what we want to know is what does this look like as a topological space? Um, so each non zero point of the real plane corresponds to a unique point of this blow up, as we saw last lecture, and the zero point of the real plane gets blown up to a copy of P1 over the reals, which is just S1. So somehow we're changing this point to a circle. Um, so you can think of this as um, having a point for each possible direction through the origin here. Now this means that we actually have a map from the blow up of R2 at a point to um, P1 of R because we can just map the point x, y, s colon t to s colon t. And p1 of r is just a circle. So we can ask what the inverse image of any point looks like. So the in inverse image of a point s colon t in p1 is just a copy of the real numbers, as you can see fairly easily. Roughly speaking, if this red line indicates a point of P1 of R, then the points in its inverse image consist of all the points on the plane together with um, a point above the origin corresponding to this direction. So um, if we write E for the blow up, then we've got a map from E to S1, such that the fibers are all the real, a copy of the real numbers. So, what, what does that mean? Well, the most obvious guess is it might be a cylinder. So a cylinder has a map to S1 and the fibers are all reals, but this is wrong because there's actually some twisting involved. Um, in fact, you can see that this blob is in fact non-orientable. For example, if we take a small um, point on um, the blow up, so I suppose we take a point here, then we can take a sort of small um, coordinate base for it. And if we pull this coordinate base through the origin, what do we get? Well, um, um, we get the, the, the sort of purple direction still continues going off in the same direction, but the blue arrow sort of gets reversed as we go through the origin. So we can see as we go from here to here, we've kind of reversed orientation. So this must actually be non-orientable. And um, the non-orientable surface that maps onto S1 and has fibers R is just homeomorphic to a Moebius band. Um, that's an open Moebius band, so you don't put a boundary on it, so it's non-compact. Um, and conversely, if you take a Moebius band, looking something like this, um, and contract, take a midline of it, and if you contract this midline to a point, what you get is just an open disk. Um, so this is a Maybe a little bit surprising because we started with an orientable surface. Blowing up a point actually turns it into a non-orientable surface. The next example is 
let's try and construct a map from P1 times P1 to P2. And you can think of P1 as being more or less a line with coordinate X. This P1 might be a line with coordinate Y. And we want to map this to the point X, Y. Well, obviously, you can't actually do that because X is not defined at the infinite point of P1. So what's the best we can do? So this doesn't quite work. So let's try again. Um, so let's take a point um, x0 colon x1 in here, y0 colon y1 in here, and map this to the point. Um, let's map it to x0, y0, um, x1, y0, sorry, x1, y0, x0, y1. Then um, you might think this gives a map from P1 times P1 to P2. For instance, if X0 and Y0 are both 1, then this is the map taking X1, Y1 to the point X1, Y1 of P2 as before. So, so this seems to be a correct version of this map. However, this is not defined um, at X0. Um, if x0 equals y0 equals 0. In other words, if we take the point 0, comma 1 and times 0, colon 1 in P1 times P1, this map isn't quite defined. So um, this map here is defined everywhere except at one point. And the point of this, uh, where we're discussing blowups, the point is you can make this defined at that point by blowing up P1 times P1. So we're going to blow up P1 times P1 at this bad point, 0, 1 times 0, 1, and see what happens. Um, well, um, we can just cover it with a copy of with a copy of the affine plane given by the points where x1 equals 1, y1 equals 1. So this, this affine plane has coordinates in x0, y0. Um, and if we blow this up at the point x0 equals y0 equals 0, then we find that this map from this blown up plane doesn't actually map to p2. Um, for instance, um, you can blow it up by putting x0 equals t y0. Um, then you find um, the point x0, y0, x1, y0, x0, y1 becomes um, t y0 squared um, x1, y0, t y0, y1. And we can take out the factor of y0 and we get t y0 x1 um, t y1. And this is now a perfectly good point of the projective plane because x1 is just equal to 1, so it's not causing problems. So in other words, we get a map from the blow up of of P1 times P1 to P2. So what we've done is we started with a rational map here. So it's a rational map. It's, it's not a regular map because there's one point where it's not defined. And we found that if we blow up one point of P1 times P1, we now get a regular map from this blow up to P1. So we've kind of turned a rational map into a regular map by blowing up a point. Next we can ask, is this an isomorphism? And the answer is no. The problem is there are two points of P2 that are the images of entire lines. So if we look at the points 0, 0, 1 in P2, this is the image of um, an entire line. It's 
in P1 times P1. Um, you can see the line is um, just the um, um, set of points um, where y naught is equal to naught in P1 times P1. And similarly, naught, naught, sorry, naught, one naught in P2 is the image of the line x naught equals naught. Um, and you can check that actually what is going on is the, the, the map from this blow up to P2 is the same as the map you get if you blow up these two points of P2. So what we find is the blow up of P1 times P1 at one point is equal to the blow up of P2 at two points. Obviously, you can ask, have we used one extra point? Is the blow up of P1 times P1 at no points equal to the blow up of P2 at one point? And the answer is no, it isn't. You have to kind of, if you want to get from P1 to times P1 to P2, you first of all have to blow up one point, and then you have to blow down two lines. Remember, blowing up a point turns it into a line. Um, uh, more generally, there are several other things you can do with blow ups. So we can, blowing up, we can blow up, we can blow up a point. And the geometric meaning Objective space of you can think of this as something like the tangent space of P. So, um, if we've got a point P, we can look at the tangent space. Well, we haven't defined tangent spaces yet, but whatever. And that's a vector space. You can take the corresponding projective space. We're kind of replacing the point by this entire projective space. Well, last lecture we saw you could also blow up along a line. And more generally, we can blow up along a subvariety um, x. The geometric meaning of this is that each p in x is replaced by the projective space of the normal um, um, the normal space at uh, p along x. In other words, informally, you think of taking the vector space of all tangent vectors that are orthogonal to the subvariety x. That gives you a vector space, and we take the corresponding geometric, corresponding projective space. Well, that doesn't actually quite make sense because in algebraic geometry, the concept of things being orthogonal to each other doesn't really make sense. You need a metric for that. Um, but there's a way around that. Instead of taking the vectors orthogonal to x, you can take the tangent space of the whole variety of x and quotient it out by the tangent space of x and so on. But, but informally, you, you think of this as being a projective space of a normal bundle. I mean, instead of a subvariety, we can actually blow up along an ideal. And so any subvariety is defined by an ideal. Um, and in fact, you can blow up along more general ideals. We'll see an example of this in a moment. More generally still, we can blow up along a quasi-coherent sheaf of graded algebras. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, what on earth does this mean? Well, that's easy enough. If you've got a graded algebra, you can construct a projective variety from it. Now, suppose you gave a graded algebra for every point of the variety, and you replaced every point by the corresponding projective space of that graded algebra. That would be a blow up. 
So the question is, how do you assign a graded algebra to every point of the variety? Well, obviously, it has to vary in a nice way. And the answer turns out to be something called a quasi-coherent sheaf of graded algebras. So this rather intimidating looking mouthful is just a rather complicated way of saying you assign a graded algebra to every point of the variety in a nice way. So this corresponds to some sort of, you, you, you sort of construct the um, projective space of a graded algebra at each point. So there's one very simple example of this. Suppose we, our entire variety is just a point. Then a quasi-coherent sheaf of graded algebras is just a graded algebra. It might be something like, say, k x naught up to x n. And then blowing up a point along this graded sheaf of coherent algebras just turns out to be the usual construction of projective space of dimension n. And um, the general form of blowing up is a sort of relative version of this construction where you do something like this, not just at one point of a variety, but at every point of a variety. Um, so um, Hironaka, um, in a rather famous paper, used repeated blowing ups along subvarieties in order to show you could resolve singularities. If you've got a variety with singularities, then by carefully blowing up repeatedly along subvarieties, you can obtain a non singular variety in high dimensional space. This proof only works in characteristic zero, and it's one of the biggest open problems in algebraic geometry to try and generalize this to varieties of non zero characteristic. Um, okay, I said I would give an example of blowing up along an ideal um, or sheaf of ideals, never mind. Um, so let's just look at the plane A2 with coordinate ring K, X, Y. Now, um, blowing up a point kind of is going to correspond to blowing up along the ideal x, y. So, so here, if we take the point 0, 0 in A2, then it corresponds to this ideal. And blowing up along a more general ideal is a sort of generalization of this construction. So suppose we've got an ideal with generators g1 up to gn, where gi is a polynomial in k, x, y. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a squared times p n minus 1, and I'm going to take the set of all points x, um, y, g1 up to g2 up to gn. Um, now, this is going to be defined if x, y is not in the subvariety um, generated by all these gi's. So this is the subvariety of the gi's. Um, because if it's not in the subvariety, then at least one of these must be non-zero. So this is well defined. So we take the image of a2 minus the subvariety in a squared times p to the n minus one, and then take the closure. And this will be a sort of blowing up um, corresponding to the ideal. Um, it's, you, you see the map from a2 to this blow up is defined everywhere except on this subvariety. And on this subvariety, it does something rather complicated and mysterious. In fact, it's actually quite difficult to understand what, what goes on. Um, Hironaka didn't use blow ups along general ideals, he just used blow ups along non singular sub varieties, which are considerably easier to understand. Um, as an example of this, suppose we take the ideal i to be generated by x squared and y squared. Then um, what we do is we just map x, y 
in A2 to the point x, y, x squared, y squared in A2 times P1. Um, so what on earth does this look like? Um, well, um, if we call these variables x, y, s, t in a squared times p1, then um, p, p1 is covered by two copies of the affine line. So let's look at one of these. Let's take s1 equal 1. Um, well, we notice that um, um, x squared t is equal to y squared times s, because s is sort of equal to x squared and t is equal to y squared, at least when x and y are not both zero. So if we take s equals 1, we get x squared t is equal to y squared. And this actually has a whole bunch of singularities because it's just the Whitney umbrella all over again. And you notice it as singularities um, along the line x equals y equals zero. So we have to be a bit careful about blowing up. We've been going on about how blowing up can get rid of singularities. If you're a little bit careless about what you blow up, you can actually introduce singularities. So we've started with a nice non-singular variety, a squared. We've blown off along some slightly strange non-reduced ideal, and we've ended up with a, with a variety that has a singularity. Um, so blowing up along more complicated ideals is a slightly mysterious operation. It's, it's very powerful, um, in fact, Hironaka's theorem implies that in characteristic zero, you can resolve any singularity in one blow up by blowing up along some complicated ideal. Unfortunately, as we've seen, these more complicated ideals can actually make things a lot worse if you're not careful. So it's, it's hard to tell what's going on. OK, the next lecture will be on a, another sort of birational map called the Atiyah Flop.